Okay, let's uh, let's start. Welcome back. So now in my last lecture, I will talk about uh, something slightly different, but still uh, related. So uh, we have talked about uh, you know simulations in equilibrium, either thermal equilibrium or uh, a ground state uh, uh, of a, of a system. So now I want to talk about how to do, uh, in particular quantum Monte Carlo simulations, how to, to describe out of equilibrium situations. Uh, and also I want to illustrate and so on uh, all this by some classical, uh, classical things. So we will do some kind of out of equilibrium scaling approaches that I want to talk about as well. Okay, so, okay, you have learned, uh, you know, everything about Monte Carlo simulations here from uh, Werner Krauts. I don't need to remind you what Monte Carlo simulations is. I just show this slide anyway as a build up to, to the following ones, but I don't need to explain what it is other than this is an illustration of an animation of a simulation, not of hard uh, spheres that uh, Werner discussed, but so-called sticky spheres, which have a small attractive shell. So here I just show a you know, very simple metropolis simulation and uh, you know, after each Monte Carlo sweep where these particles are removed, uh, moved at random and accepted with the metropolis probability, I just uh, make a frame and then show these as a movie. And this is at some high temperature where this system is, is in a, a gas phase. Okay, uh, now let's lower the temperature uh, and what happens then? Uh, well, now the simulation has already been going on for some time, and I show here the same simulation, but on two different time scales. You see here to the right, time uh, goes a hundred times faster than on the left. Uh, and the point I want to make with this is that now it's taking us a long time to go to equilibrium. So, of course, I could use some cluster algorithm or something like that, that uh, Werner uh, talked uh, about, uh, that is really, really nice. But uh, here I just want to make the point that if you do something with local updates, uh, which is, you know, often what nature does, right? Nature has, uh, you know, more local kind of updates. Well, nature does molecular dynamics, I guess, but... Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's not easy always to reach the equilibrium. And why, why do I say that this is not equilibrium? Well, because I think we have reached a liquid phase here, and we have formed some uh, droplets. Uh, but I think if we expect that the equilibrium should be just one droplet, right? So that minimizes the uh, interfaces. Okay, so what, what we can do then is something that... Uh, uh, I think Werner didn't talk about, although I think he had had it in the original um, uh, abstract, namely simulated annealing, but then I can talk about it instead uh, quickly. So simulated annealing is basically if you do a Monte Carlo simulation, but you change the temperature during the simulation. And of course the name comes from uh, uh, the fact that this is a computational analog of physical annealing that is done in, you know, metallurgy, for example, that you heat something and then slowly cool something to form a more perfect crystal. Uh, so this is done then in the simulation and it has a, a similar effect, effect that if you want to reach equilibrium without defects, you can uh, change the temperature uh, during the simulation. So this is illustrated now here. So now you see that uh, the temperature is changing here between each frame. So I'm still in the gas phase, but now you start to see that uh, liquid is forming, and now it has a very easy time to, uh, to form a single droplet because it had enough fluctuations uh, at the higher temperatures, and when it started to get into the liquid state, that it could uh, uh, form one single droplet. <clears throat> okay, so, so this simulated annealing is something that is also used for optimization. I think many of you probably know that. Uh, so when we, for example, here I went with my simulated annealing all the way to zero temperature. If I do that slowly enough, I should reach the lowest possible energy state of the system. And you can say that uh, that's an optimization problem. It's optimizing the energy of the system. 
And of course, simulated annealing is a very often uh, used and successful optimization method. So you can express many difficult optimization problems with many variables uh, as a statistical mechanics problem. And you can do Monte Carlo simulations on it, and you can reduce the temperature as a function of time, and you can uh, uh, reach the optimum or at least close to the optimum in that way. And of course, the slower you go, the closer you would typically get to the best state. Okay, that's simulated annealing. Okay, so a question that people have started to ask uh, a lot recently is, is, well, already some time ago, but it has become very popular now, is can we do something similar in, in quantum uh, uh, annealing with quantum mechanics, and then it's called uh, quantum annealing. So again, in thermal annealing, we change the temperature as a function of time, and we could do it in a physical system, and we can do it in a simulation. Uh, uh, in quantum annealing, you can think of doing it in some physical system, where you have some way of regulating the quantum fluctuations. So you can st start uh, with some simple quantum system, uh, okay, and then you can, as a function of time, change the parameters in such a way that in the end you just get a classical system. You completely remove uh, all the kinetic uh, energy. Uh, and uh, then if you do this, uh, uh, okay, so let's, let's write down the, what I mean in Hamiltonian form. So you have a Hamiltonian which has two parts, H0 and HS, and a S is your control parameter. And these are some non-commuting uh, uh, terms. Uh, and then I can imagine that this parameter S depends on time. And of course, it could depend on time in any number of ways. But here I will use the simplest case where it just depends linearly on time. And the velocity is just 1 divided by, by the total time uh, I take to do that. OK, uh, so then we know from the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics that if this process is very slow, then you will always stay in the ground state. So that means if you, when you start, you have H0. And if that's a simple quantum system, you can prepare the system in, in its ground state. Then if you go slowly enough to T max, then you will be in the ground state of the system at, 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 uh, which is now in, in, uh, just consisting of H1. So if H1 is some complicated classical potential, for example, some hard optimization problem corresponds to some hard optimization problem, then uh, uh, you have succeeded in uh, finding the optimal solution by this quantum annealing. OK? <clears throat> so then the question is, can uh, quantum annealing be more efficient than thermal annealing? And then you know, we are imagining that somebody is actually building a machine which is, you know, you can program and uh, you can have some Hamiltonian in that machine where you can encode some optimization problem as a H1 and then there's some suitable quantum fluctuation which is often called the driver which uh, you can uh, play with. And then the question is, can that solve some optimization problems that are very hard to do classically, including this simulation, simulated uh, annealing method would not be uh, very efficient. <clears throat> so there are, of course, many such problems that can so, uh, be solved only with great difficulty in, in times that uh, scale exponentially bad with the number of degrees of freedom of the problem. So the question is if we can do something uh, better with uh, uh, thermal annealing. So as you see here, this, these ideas go back quite some times. There are many other important early papers. <clears throat> but now people are really exploring this seriously as a paradigm for, for quantum computing. Uh, and in fact, you can already, already buy this machine if you have 10, 15 million dollars hanging around that you don't uh, know what to do with. Then D-Wave systems will be very happy to sell, sell you one of their nice-looking black boxes. 
Uh, and I think Google is also now going to build a machine. I don't know if they also want to sell it or just use it for their own optimization purposes. Uh, probably something to do with, uh, you know, with, with commercials and ads on your web browser. But anyway, uh, that what's claimed is that by D-Wave is that they can already solve some hard optimization problems in, in these black boxes. Uh, and uh, this has caught a lot of attention, including, I think this was about a year ago, or maybe a little bit more, Time magazine had this cover talking about the D-Wave machine. <clears throat> I don't know if you can read it here if you are, you know, Lufthansa employees, uh, pilots, but, but it says here, it promises to sol solve some of humanity's most complex problems. And then it says something about the price, $10 million. And okay, and nobody knows how it actually works. Okay, but I, I, I should correct that. I think the statement should be nobody knows if it actually works. <laughs> uh, How the I think this is Fahrenheit. You know, it's an Amer it's an American <laughs> uh, journal, right? So, <laughs> uh, right. But it's uh, it's cooled with liquid helium, I believe. So it, it's it's very it has to be very cold. Uh, it, it's based on. Um, uh, on these kind of, uh, I mean, you, you, you build qubits uh, based on these, uh, what are these called again, squids or whatever. Uh, uh, I forget the, the name now, but you know what it is, you see from the picture. Uh, but, but anyway, it, the question is, is this really doing uh, uh, quantum annealing? So people are, have been quite skeptical, but there's a lot of work going on. Physicists have access to this machine. Uh, and investigating it heavily. Uh, so one question is, okay, what is the D-Wave machine doing? That has become a big uh, research topic. And I guess soon uh, another topic will be, what is the Google machine doing? Uh, and it's all very cool, of course. Uh, uh, but another uh, more fundamental question is, is quantum annealing really better than simulated annealing? If you could really do, uh, uh, you know, build a D-Wave machine or whatever, which actually does, is com has a, uh, completely isolated from its environment, so it's really coherent quantum dynamics or so. Is it still, you know, a good idea to, to do this? Uh, so that's more the question I want to uh, address here. But let's see in this D-Wave machine, what is it actually that they claim to uh, implement? So they have this chip. Uh, which had some fancy name, which I also forget what it was. Uh, but uh, uh, basically they claim to implement the icing model with random couplings. So you have some icing spins, which are those flux, flux qubits, uh, in, in the flux qubits that I showed you before. Uh, the up and down spins are encoded in those. Uh, and then they can somehow uh, in this thing uh, control how these are coupled to each other. Uh, okay, and uh, in, in the current machine, I think a new one is coming out soon, but in the recent one that I know of, they have 512 qubits that are coupled in a geometry called the chimera lattice. Uh, and you see there are these two by four uh, cells where you have all connections possible within the cells, but then the cells are connected to each other in a more sparse way. And you see some red dots, and I think you can imagine what the red dot means. This is taken from a recent paper by, by these authors. So yeah, so that, that's the <coughs> qubits that apparently don't work anymore. And actually, if you look at all the papers, you see less red dots, apparently. They, they stop functioning one by one, but this is still enough to, 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 to play around with, I guess. Uh, okay, so, and you can actually even go online and learn how to program the machine. Uh, I mean, it's really, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the real thing. Uh, so you can program the quantum computer. And uh, then, uh, okay, what's quantum mechanical? This is just classical, right? So, but, but here, this is where you encode the problem that you would like to optimize or solve. And then the driver is the transverse field. So, so your Hamiltonian is, is a complicated icing model, depending on what kind of couplings you program it. And there's a transverse field, which is, again, 
physically realized in this flux qubit in some way that I, I don't really know how it's done. Okay, and then as a function of time, and uh, I think that uh, I shouldn't say what the time scales are, maybe, maybe milliseconds, I'm not sure, or maybe it's just microseconds. They, they change uh, the strength uh, of, uh, of this field. So it's convenient to write it always with this uh, S and 1 over S, then you go from uh, in, a, in a somehow easy to, to see way from, from H naught to H1. Uh, Okay, and, and uh, in the ideal situation in what people call adiabatic quantum computing, you would like really to stay in the ground state the whole time. Uh, but the D-Wave people, they realize that they are not really doing uh, adiabatic quantum computing. They are not staying uh, completely in, 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 in the ground state. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, they... they talk about this as simulated quantum annealing. Uh, or, or, and more recently, people have started to talk about quantum enhanced optimization, which I think means that it's less quantum mechanical than one would uh, hope. But, but, but anyway, let, let's just, uh, I just want to talk about, you know, true quantum annealing, there's no environment, just address the question that how good in principle can, can, can this be if you really have an ideal situation? Uh, or maybe in the end you don't want to have an ideal situation. Maybe you know the noise even can help you. That's something people are exploring uh, as well. But let's. Uh, I mean, this for sure. Has, yes. I'm a little confused. Are you claiming that this machine actually does the quantum dynamics on the qubits of this transistor? Well, I mean that that's what the company claims if you go to their website. But I think any physicist who has done this, or maybe probably even if you talk to the D-Wave people, uh, it's not completely clear how quantum, mech I mean, there's clearly something quantum mechanical there, but what is the coherence times and so on is... is so, uh, my question was, this computer, are they doing it effectively on a classical computer, actually they're manipulating qubits to do this? No, no, they're manipulating the qubits, right? I mean, these are, these are the qubits, right? But what I'm going to do will not be manipulating the qubits. I, I'm going to just study this uh, question from the model, you know, th theoretical computational, I mean, classical computational perspective, meaning using some classical simulations to try to uh, try to address the question, right? Yeah, so may maybe that was your question. <laughs> so, so basically, this has stimulated a lot of interest in studying the dynamic or dynamics of the transverse field Ising model, in particular, ones that have, uh, you know, random and frustrated interactions and so on, <laughs> which people studied all, already, you know, in the past, people have studied quantum spin glasses, and, you know, this is basically a model of a quantum spin glass. If you program some, or I should not say program anymore, if you just uh, theoretically make these uh, couplings frustrated, let's say plus minus J on the nearest neighbor cubic uh, lattice, uh, you know, that's a quantum spin glass, and then if you put the transverse field, it's a quantum uh, icing spin glass, and people have studied those a lot, but focusing on, uh, you know, the equilibrium uh, ground state properties and so on. And now uh, it's very interesting to study uh, the quantum dynamics of, of those models. Okay. So uh, if we do this quantum evolution from, uh, uh, in some sense a simple state, so the simple state will be the uh, ground state of the transverse field, so all spins just point in one direction, right? And then to some state which is complicated because it should be the ground state of this complicated uh, interaction. Then uh, at least if the system is big in some sense, you would expect that there should be a, a, a quantum phase transition along the way because the ground state changes from something which is trivial to complex. And to me, that, that means there must be a quantum phase transition, and this is what people have been saying for a long time. So you expect a quantum trans phase transition at some uh, critical value of this S. And of course, if we talk about a quantum phase transition, we, we imagine that we are taking the limit of an infinitely large system size which at first sight doesn't seem to be relevant to these machines. But the thing is people are interested in how 
problem scale with the system size or with the problem size. So if you use, uh, if you solve a problem with, you know, 10 qubits and then, you know, 100, 1000, how much longer does it take to solve the kind of problem that you are interested in? Okay, and if you, then you can formally at least, at least ask the question about, you know, the limit of n going to infinity. And then you, you really also uh, run into the issue of a quantum phase transition. <clears throat> okay, so in the clean case, uh, you know, this is well understood. Uh, again, we can, you know, if we have a transverse field icing model, we can do the mapping. If we have it in D dimensions, we can map it to a D plus one dimensional uh, system and, uh, if, you know, for example, do simulations, but just formally we can do that mapping. So it should actually map onto an icing model in one more dimension. So we know that there's a phase transition in it. Uh, and if we look at, uh, again, what happens, we, when S is zero or S is small, we have the ground state of the transverse field. And when we go to S equals one, the ground state is doubly degenerate, all up or all down. And uh, in reality, if we do something, we should get symmetry breaking, we should get up or down if the symmetry, uh, if the system is big. <clears throat> so in 1D, this is uh, known, the critical point is at S equals one half, and in 2D, it's a, at around 0.25. Okay, so if we do adiabatic quantum computing, quantum annealing very slowly, we want to stay in the ground state essentially all the time. Uh, then the bottleneck is actually to pass through this critical point. And why is that? Well, because if you look at the excitation gap of the system, it's smallest at the critical point. And if we look at some basic uh, considerations of quantum dynamics, if you want to stay uh, in, in the ground state, you have to go slower if the gap is smaller. I will talk a little bit more about that. So. You can ask, how long does it take as a problem, as a function of the system size, if you want to do it, for example, in the ferromagnet, or if you want to do it in a more difficult situation where it's some spin glass or something like that. <clears throat> so let's let's look at the prototypical, uh, you know, uh, single spin uh, problem for that to at least get some feeling for what's going on. So if you just have a one single spin and you put it in a magnetic field, this is your Hamiltonian. Uh, and then you also put it in a, in a transversal field. So you have the Z, uh, Zeeman field, and then you have a, you know, a, a transverse field. And you can write it with these uh, uh, ladder operators. Uh, so the energies, you can easily solve this uh, system. So this is uh, the energy levels of the system as a function of, uh, of this uh, uh, H uh, for some, uh, uh, you know, some value of the small value of the transverse field. Uh, or sorry, let's see, right. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, there, there's a... Uh, a gap here, uh, which is at equal to two, two times epsilon, which is the, the transversal field. So if the transversal field is, sm is small, it looks like that. And if you look at, <coughs> at the eigenstates, okay, if the field is negative, then it's down, and the field is uh, positive, it's up in the ground state, and, and vice versa. And of course, in this region here, uh, you mix them. Uh, so if you go, Adiabatically, you want to go very slowly. So if you start here, you want to stay there. If you go too fast, you will have a lot of excitations up to here. You will always, no matter how slowly you go, you will excite a little bit, but you want to excite as little as possible. <clears throat> and then if you use some reasonable criterion for you know, how to stay adiabatic, let's say that you, know, you want to be 99.9% .9 in the ground state when you come here, uh, then you will find that the time you have to take to go from here to here will scale as 1 over delta squared, meaning the velocity of the change has to scale as delta squared. So if the gap is small, you have to go very slowly. So all these 
time just comes from passing this point where uh, where the gap is small. It's very easy to stay adiabatic here because the gap is large. As you approach here, it, it you have to go slower and slower if you want to stay adiabatic. <clears throat> so this little problem uh, has guided people's intuition a lot in, in this field. Uh, and uh, it suggests that uh, the gap is important. But of course, in a real situation, if you have many spins, let's say you have a ferromagnet, uh, the, the picture may look a bit similar. Um, but you will have lots of, of, of states here. <clears throat> so, so then you may start to guess that it's not just the gap here that matters, but actually what matters is, well, the, the actual shape here in the, in the single spin problem, this is a, a parabolic shape here, but in general the shape may, may be something else. If you have a really, you know, a large system and you approach some phase transition, you could have some, some shape that is, you know, different. I don't know how to draw it, but, uh, and you could have a high density of states here, so then there's a larger probability to excite something if you have more states, right? <clears throat> so, so what should you really expect if you have a quantum phase transition in a many-body system? Okay, it turns out that uh, the gap still plays some role. So let's talk about the gap uh, at the quantum phase transition. So in particular, we have to talk about the dynamic exponent. So the dynamic exponent at the phase transition is the exponent that relates time and length scales. So we have talked about continuous phase transitions now. So we know that the correlation length, which is the space length scale, diverges as a power law. The time scale, or you can call it the relaxation time, something like that, <clears throat> that goes with this length scale is a power of the length scale. And that power defines the dynamic exponent. Okay? So that means uh, if we go to finite size, uh, one can actually show that you know, using this kind of finite size scaling techniques. And, and basically, the gap is one over uh, one, one over the length scale to the z. So one over the time scale, right? That's, that, that's natural. <clears throat> so you just replace the length scale by the system size. Uh, then you see that the gap should go like, like, like this. And if you write it in terms of the system size, this is the length. So if you have a d-dimensional system, it may be better to write it, uh, uh, well, sometimes it's better to write it like this, sometimes like that. But in any case, what we can guess from the lambda zena problem <coughs> is that if the gap is very small, you have a problem. And now, you know, apparently the gap becomes very small as you increase the system size. But the lambda zena problem would here still tell you that, OK, this is fine, because uh, if the time is 1 over delta squared, then it's just L to the 2z is my, is my time. So that's uh, still a polynomial of the system size. <clears throat> so if, if that would still hold for some difficult optimization problem where you know, the best known algorithms scale exponentially, it would be big news because that would mean that you can actually solve it in a, in a, in a polynomial time, a power law time. But actually what people have realized is that in some cases, these transitions are actually of first order when it comes to the kind of, of problems that uh, you know, computer scientists have, uh, have considered in encoding in these icing spins. <clears throat> so if you have a first order transition, actually the gap closes exponentially fast. So that means also the time scales exponentially. So, so this is an important issue that was pointed out by Peter Young and collaborators some years ago. So uh, 
if you have a first order situation, it, it's, it's bad news. Uh, uh, but there's at least some hope that you can formulate at least some classes of problems in such a way that you avoid the first order transition. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's let's assume now that we we have some continuous transition uh, and look at well, is this Landau Zener picture really correct? So according to the Landau Landau Zener. Uh, the velocity should go like 1 over L to the 2Z, which is the gap squared. I is that really true? <clears throat> and again, it may not be true because of these reasons that I mentioned. Uh, so it turns out that this so the solution to this problem has been out there for a long time, but Initially, and maybe still, the people that work in this, uh, you know, quantum adiabatic uh, field, they have not been very much aware of this. So there's something called uh, kibble zurek uh, scaling. <clears throat> so according to, to Kibble and Zurek, uh, let me not discuss why now, but it has actually to do with, with exactly these things that I discussed. Um, uh, the critical velocity is actually not L to the 2z, but L to the minus z plus 1 over, one over nu. And we know what nu is from, from the previous lecture. And I, I mentioned it already here. <clears throat> so this was in some form derived by Kibble and Zurek. Uh, and uh, my colleague at BU, Anatoly Polkovnikov, and some other people around the same time, they, uh, it was initially done classically for classical uh, phase transitions, and he uh, uh, came up with the generalization to the quantum case. Uh, it's actually not so difficult to, to derive this, but le let me just state it as a result here. <clears throat> so it turns out that the criterion is actually identical for quantum and classical phase transitions. Okay, so we talked about finite sc size scaling uh, last lecture, and that's good because now uh, I need to talk about some more finite size scaling. <clears throat> but now it, it's a generalized finite size scaling, uh, which has what we discussed uh, last lecture, namely, if you have a quantity and you approach the critical point, uh, then there's a an overall size dependence, and there's this argument that tells you how things scale as you move away from the critical point. Okay, but now there's another argument there as well, and that argument is basically the velocity divided by the kibble zurek velocity, which is exactly v. <coughs> That comes in as another hypothesis. And this has actually not really been proven in the sense that uh, normal finite size scaling has, but it's a very natural uh, hypothesis to, to propose. Um, and we can you know, write it as a function of L, or as you will see later, sometimes it's really better to uh, write it as a function of N. Uh, and then I just uh, define some velocity, uh, some uh, uh, dimensionality, renormalized exponents like that. Okay, but the point is we have two arguments there now, <clears throat> uh, and this is actually what we will be exploring to study some dynamics of of classical as well as uh, quantum systems. Okay, so let's look at the classical case first. Uh, and now I will show an actual uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So this was done by my former student, uh, Cheng Wei Liu. <clears throat> so what's shown here is just uh, an icing simulation. Uh, and it's done with the Metropolis algorithm. But it actu it's actually like simulated annealing. So uh, when the simulation starts, we sit at some 
rather high temperature, and then the temperature is reduced as a function of time, and we go to the critical temperature of the 2D icing model. <coughs> uh, and now we can do it at different velocities. So first, uh, I show uh, a fast uh, ramp of the temperature. Uh, and what you can see here is we start in some equilibrated configuration. Okay, and then we just do a few steps. Uh, and not much is really happening. Well, the configuration is, uh, is changing, of course, but overall it doesn't really look much different. It doesn't really look like it's, it's uh, approaching a critical point. <clears throat> uh, and this is clearly because the velocity, the time is so short that the system doesn't have time to adapt. Okay, now let's do it slower, more slowly. So now you can see that actually the final configuration looks more like, like a critical configuration, similar to what, uh, what you saw uh, yesterday in Werner's le lecture. Okay, <clears throat> so now we can actually do a, an analysis of simulations like this. So exactly like, like is shown in this first animation here. We repeat it many times, but of course, the animation just repeats the same thing many times. But in, uh, in our work, we, of course, start from a different configuration every time. <clears throat> so there is an equilibrium simulation going on, and, and then we have a, a configuration, and then we do this uh, simulated annealing down to TC, and then we do another one, another one, and then we calculate things like the squared magnetization. And then we look at how it depends on the system size and the velocity. Okay. <clears throat> so now we can simplify things a little bit because in this case we know the critical temperature. So we can actually just collect the data at our final point. Okay, we can collect data everywhere and analyze it, but what I show you now is just the data at the final point. Okay, then the scaling is much easier because if delta is zero, the first argument delta L1 over nu is just zero, so it's like there's no, uh, no first argument. <clears throat> so then we just have, have this form here. And now this looks quite a lot like what we did before with data collapse, right? You have some overall L dependence, and then you have a function of some argument. Okay, in this case, we even know that exponent. It's just one, as I told you last time. <clears throat> okay, how about Z? Well, Z is the dynamic exponent, which, let's see, did Werner talk about the dynamic exponent? I, I, I forget, but anyway, it's, uh, it, it's again telling you how the time scale is related to the length scale. Um, and um, it's, uh, that, that, of course, uh, is the time scale is the time scale he was talking about, the time scale needed to, you know, uh, for the system to generate independent configurations. That's exactly, uh, this is exactly the exponent which governs that time scale. <clears throat> so if you have a, a bad Monte Carlo algorithm, the value is going to be big. Uh, and if you have a poor, al uh, uh, a good algorithm, the value is going to be small. Ideally, the value would be zero. Okay. So uh, people have, of course, studied uh, this for the metropolis uh, dynamic and dynamics and other dynamics as well. And it's known that the value is around 2.2 for, for the Ising model. But what we will do is we will pretend that we don't know it. And then we will see if we can extract it. Okay, and this is uh, uh, what we do. So this looks very similar to the kind of finite size scaling we did before, <clears throat> except that on this axis, okay, it's L to some power, but the power is a little bit different from before. There's the Z there. And instead of the distance to the critical point, we have the velocity. Uh, but on this axis, it's exactly the same as, as before, if we want to get data collapse. And you see we get quite good data collapse. 
Uh, so you see we have many different system sizes. Uh, and we can uh, actually, you know, to do this data collapse, we actually uh, do it with some data fitting. So we, we model the form by a straight line here, and actually the straight line is uh, expected from this form as well. You can actually relate the slope to the exponents as well. And then this shoulder here we describe by a polynomial, and they are matched to each, each other. <clears throat> and that actually is, is basically how we do the data collapse. We, we somehow do the best fit to that form, uh, and the form you know, contains z as an, uh, as an adjustable parameter. So z is the only unknown thing. Okay, you can see for each system size, when we go to high velocity, the, it splits off from this uh, collapsed curve. And that's expected because this, exactly like finite size scaling holds, only when the system size becomes big enough, uh, this holds only when the velocity becomes small enough. So we expect data collapse when exactly when the velocity is, you know, less than or on the off the order of uh, the kibble zurich velocity. Uh, so if we scale the data in this way, uh, for each system size, there will be some point where, you know, the velocity is higher than, than that value, whatever it is, and then it starts to split off. And if we, be, we really go to infinite velocity, we, this would just go to the value uh, in the starting equilibrium state, right? So that we understand, and actually we can plot the data in a different way where we get data collapse on that part. <clears throat> but if you imagine chopping off all those, you know, tails, you would actually see essentially a perfect uh, data collapse. And what what is the? Uh, okay, so here we used the again dicing exponents, of course, uh, and we adjusted z and our result. Well, I don't know why I didn't uh, show all our glorious four digits here, but we got it to something like four digits, and we believe it's the best value. Uh, anybody extracted, although that was not the goal. The goal was just to explore how this works. But <clears throat> we do believe that this is actually a very good way to extract the dynamic exponent if you don't know it. So, for example, we have a very recent paper in collaboration with Peter Young where we apply it to the 3D classical spin glass, uh, which has been very challenging to, to find the dynamic exponent for. <clears throat> and the reason it's so challenging is because in that case, the dynamic exponent is very large. In glasses, normally the dynamics is very slow. It's actually around six, uh, and we, that, that's the result we got, and that's why, why it's so difficult. And we did it exactly in this way. Right, so we have a paper. If you, if you are interested in more about this, you can read about, you know, we, we tested this on uh, also on these cluster uh, dynamics that uh, Werner talked about. Uh, okay, but now the real question is that we are interested in is, can we do something like this for quantum systems? Right? Okay. Um, so let's talk about quantum dynamics. Okay, we have some initial state, and we want to study the time evolution, so we act with... Uh, the time evolution operator. <clears throat> and in our case, the Hamiltonian itself is time dependent. So this is the, the time evolution operator. It contains an integral of, of the Hamiltonian uh, from time, time, time t0 to t. Uh, OK, this is not easy to study numerically, right? OK, you can study small systems. I say exact diagonalization here, but actually a better thing is just to use a standard differential equation solver and adapt it to, to matrix uh, problems. You can solve the dynamics very easily, but only for small systems because, of course, the matrices grow exponentially with n. <clears throat> uh, okay, people are making some progress in DMRG and so on, but still it's, it's not easy. So what we have proposed, uh, and other people have proposed it also, but we are doing things slightly different, and we have some, I think, new claims. 
uh, is to study the Schrodinger dynamics in imaginary time with quantum Monte Carlo. Okay, so, okay, you may say, well, imaginary time, that's not what we want, but okay, I agree. We want real time, but we cannot do it, so we do something else. And of course, we still want to get something useful out of it, and we actually can uh, relate the two in, in several ways. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, the imaginary time evolution operator. And the thing is that this can be implemented quite nicely in uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo algorithms of the type I talked to you about uh, yesterday or on Wednesday. Okay, so that was the first version of that was done a few years ago. But then you can ask, well, what really can imaginary time tell us about real-time dynamics? So let me, before I talk about Quono Monte Carlo, let me talk about, uh, you know, these exact solutions of small systems. And uh, we have actually done a lot of work recently on these random glassy models, but let me just show you something about uh, an icing ferromagnet in, in the transverse field. <clears throat> so this again is the Hamiltonian, and uh, now we are going to be on a small uh, two-dimensional two lattice, so n equals l squared. And uh, okay, it's a pitifully small lattice, it, we will just study a 4 by 4 but still it tells us something. <clears throat> so then we start from the eigenstate of the transverse field, of course, and um, we are going to look at the instantaneous, uh, well, so the uh, actual ground state we would like to stay in if we are uh, adiabatic, we denote like this, so at each time we have some value of s, and for that value of s, the ground state is what we call uh, psi naught of t. <clears throat> but the actual state, since we are not going infinitely slowly, is different, and we call that psi of t. Okay, and then we want to compare these, and we can do different things. We can look at the energy, how much does the energy deviate from, uh, from the ground state and so on. <clears throat> Here I will just show what's called the log fidelity. So it's the overlap between these two states, and then you take a log to make it easier to manage, and you take a minus one half in front of it uh, to make it a little nicer. So then if, uh, uh, if, we, if this is zero, it's, uh, it's a perfect overlap, right? And then it, it, it becomes positive. Uh, the, the minus log fidelity is defined like this is, is positive if they are different. Okay, and then we integrate the Schrodinger equation numerically. Uh, and do these things both for real and imaginary time. <clears throat> okay, so the, the question you may in, in, in then be interested in is that which one is more adiabatic, which one is easier to stay in, um, in, uh, in the uh, uh, ground state. And actually there's a very simple intuition about this. So we discussed uh, projector simulations last time. So if you take this operator, which is the time evolution operator with a constant Hamiltonian, when beta goes to infinity, I could have thought, called this tau for now to make it. This projects out the ground state, right? <clears throat> so imaginary time dynamic brings you towards the ground state all the time. So here the Hamiltonian is, is changing, but you can imagine that this is done for, you know, for in, in, in some small time steps. <clears throat> and somehow it's clear that this somehow brings you towards the ground state, although it cannot quite keep up because it brings you towards the ground state, but the ground state keeps changing, right? But still the intuition would be that uh, imaginary time should be <coughs> uh, stay closer to the ground state because it has this projection property which uh, real-time dynamics doesn't have, right? <clears throat> if you just do 
you know, real-time evolution of some arbitrary state, the, uh, the energy is conserved, right? So it, it doesn't bring you closer to the ground state. Okay, but let, let's see what actually happens. <clears throat> so now we'll show results for several velocities. Okay, so the red is real time, and this is this minus log fidelity. <clears throat> and uh, the black one is the imaginary time. And here happened exactly as the intuition tells you. Uh, so remember, if this is zero, that means we are in the actual ground state. So here you see that there's just a, a little peak and then it goes to zero. Here there's also a peak, but then there's some oscillations and it just tends to some, well, oscillations continues, but it doesn't drop to zero. <clears throat> and actually this little peak here, uh, although this is a small system, there is already some hint of a phase transition in it. And uh, uh, this shows you that when you go through the phase transition, that's when you start to excite uh, the higher states. Okay. Let's so I should go until noon, right? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Let's do lower velocity. Uh, okay, it looks a bit similar, but now you see that real and imaginary time have come a little closer to each other. <clears throat> and actually one interesting thing here is that momentarily the real time quantity drops below imaginary time. So that immediately tells us that it's not true that imaginary time is always closer to the ground state. Sometimes real time can be, but normally it's when some oscillation just dips you below like that. Yep. No, this is done numerically again, just solving the differential equation, the Schrodinger equation, numerically. No, no, this is really the, the, yeah, it's very difficult to do analytic continuation here. Actually, it's, you know, in principle, we know how to do analytic continuation in the equilibrium. <clears throat> Out of equilibrium, in principle, you can write down something, but it's absolutely impossible to do anything with it in practice, as far as I can tell. So, so that doesn't really work. Uh, anyway, uh, let, let's go on. <clears throat> so now, well, by the way, notice that the values on the y-axis continue to go down because we, we really get, get closer and closer to the ground state, even at the peak value. But now you start to see that overall, although real time has oscillations that imaginary time doesn't, they actually start to look very similar. Right. Uh, okay, one more time, uh, lower velocity. Uh, now they are almost exactly the same. And why is that? Well, we can show, at least my colleague Anatoly Polkonikov can show, <coughs> uh, using what's called adiabatic perturbation theory, one can show that these are the same to or up to and including order velocity squared. The differences come in at order velocity cubed. And at that order, you can actually not tell generically which one is faster. Real time could be faster. Imaginary time could be faster. But what we find in general, except for some uh, exceptional cases, imaginary time when we come finally to this point here is, is uh, closer to the ground state. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and actually one can formulate these things with some, you know, one can define some dynamic susceptibilities, which, you know, because they are, the, these things are the same up to some order, these dynamic susceptibilities are, uh, are the same. Okay, and what one can also show, which we did in this paper, is that if you go through a phase transition and you're interested in the dynamic exponent, you can actually do it in imaginary time because they are exactly the same. Okay. So that motivates us then to actually study imaginary time dynamics of, you know, including spin glasses and uh, models that are somehow of interest in <coughs> quantum computing because we can actually say something 
uh, on uh, uh, you know, the criterion to stay adiabatic based on imaginary time dynamics, which we can study uh, with quantum Monte Carlo, at least for the models where we don't have sign problems, right? Of course, if we have a, a sign problem in the equil equilibrium QMC, we will have it here as well. But let me say a little bit about <coughs> uh, how this algorithm works. So again, this is the time evolution operator. We start with some initial state. Uh, so this is, this is what we did in our first paper. We just say, okay, let's do what we do in stochastic series expansion. We just do a Taylor expansion of this exponential. Then you get all these uh, integrals here and note that it's time ordering here. <coughs> uh, okay, and now this actually works very much like uh, stochastic ex series expansion, except that you also have the time integrals, but actually it's almost trivial to add that to, to the thing. And the main difference is that the Hamiltonian is now not constant, but it starts at something here, and then it, it changes always monotonically uh, as you go here. But that's also a very simple change <coughs> to, to put in if you have a quantum Monte Carlo. If you have a projection, quantum Monte Carlo projector code, it's really easy to, to implement this. Okay, we also have explored actually a simpler scheme. It turns out that, you know, these time integrals are really not so important here, believe it or not. The important thing is that you have a sequence of Hamiltonians that change. So actually, if you completely forget about the integrals and just do uh, Hamiltonians that change uniformly as a function of this index here. <clears throat> you can still think of this as time now, but it's, it's somehow not, it's not real imaginary time before, but it's fake imaginary time, but it's almost the same. <clears throat> so if uh, we have a delta S, which is, you know, the S maximum value. So this S again, you can think of as the S in the transverse field icing model that I talked about. M is uh, you know, the yeah, M is, is, is how many of these you have. So in each step, it changes by, by delta S. So we can actually show that, again, this is the same as Schrodinger dynamics up to order V squared. So any sort of, you know, leading dynamic response is going to be the same as Schrodinger dynamics up to some trivial factors that we can put in if we like. <coughs> Uh, but it's important to see what is the velocity. So naively you may think, well, the velocity is somehow given, you know, by, um, uh, so you have, you know, the total change and then you have, you know, how many steps you take, but actually you have to multiply that by N, it turns out. Uh, and it, it's somehow very easy to see if you do these uh, series expansions and look at what orders contribute and you can show it in, in adiabatic perturbation theories as well. So the velo velocity will be proportional to n times delta s. <coughs> uh, there's some prefactor which we, in principle, can calculate. Right. And, okay, the point again is that we can access, basically, dynamic behaviors that are same in, in real and imaginary time. Okay, just quickly about implementation. Let me just illustrate it a little bit. And it should be pretty clear because it's not so different from what we looked at on Wednesday. Although now the model is different. There we looked at, uh, at the Heisenberg model, right, which has a diagonal part which is, you know, pretty similar to this one. But in this case, I'm showing it for, an, for a ferromagnet, so it's, I add a constant here. And I also put the Pauli matrices here instead of the spin operators, but that doesn't matter. <clears throat> so this is one, the diagonal operator, and this is the off-diagonal operator, okay? Uh, so the vertices, we have in this case, we have, you know, two side vertices, and now I draw them in the horizontal direction instead of vertically. So these are, you can think, incoming spins and outgoing. Uh, we have two ferromagnetic vertices, and then we have these single spin vertices where the spin flips, okay? And now we just put these together in the network exactly as we did in, in SSE. 
<coughs> this is one component of your starting state. So the starting state would normally be the superposition of equal superposition of ups and downs, because that's the x magnetized state. So this is just one component. Uh, and here you see I have some operators that are uh, you know, doing things or just sitting there. Uh, and then again, one can formulate some algorithm which is updating this uh, network of operators by moving them around and replacing them by each other and, and uh, uh, flipping spins by making, in this case, some kind of clusters and so on. So one can sample these configurations. <clears throat> so this is a configuration which represents basically this overlap here. So you project from the left and from the right. And this is the starting transverse field eigenstate. Okay. So it's very similar to ground state projection. The, the, the only difference is that here the matrix elements, the actual values associated with the vertices are changing. But again, a very simple thing to add to your code. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's here, it's not transition graph, but if you measure some diagonal quantity, you can just go in the middle here and, you know, evaluate it, and uh, for the energy there is some, uh, <coughs> you know, expression and so on. So, you know, it, it can be done. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, this graph I already talked about, right? So, I, for some reason... Uh, I, I have some duplicate. I think I moved them and forget to the, delete them here. So I just, uh, okay, so this is the new one. Okay, so now we want to look at kibble surex scaling in imag imaginary time. So I already talked about this for, <coughs> for um, uh, the classicalizing model where we did, you know, stochastic metropolis dynamics. Now we are going to do actual, you know, uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, and actually speaking about expectation values, uh, you know, I said we should measure something in the middle. That would be the actual, you know, uh, uh, measurement that you're interested in. Let, let me go actually back to this. Ah, it's too far. Let me not go back to the picture. Uh, well, I, I'm there now. So if we actually measure, you know, the expectation value, we should measure it here. <clears throat> but it turns out that actually we can also measure things uh, anywhere we like. And to sufficiently good approximations, they actually represent the time dependence of some quantity. So, you know, the time changes from here to here. So this is at the final time where we really should look at things. But it's actually even fine to look somewhere else and to say that this is the expectation value evaluated at whatever the time is here. Uh, again, the, the, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same to high enough order in the velocity that it actually uh, works to do scaling. So, so that's what we are actually doing. So let me illustrate that. <clears throat> so this is the expectation value, but now you see I have a, uh, I don't put the operator in the middle, I can put it anywhere. Uh, so then one can actually, in a single simulation, get values for all times. So that saves a lot of time. So there's an animation of, of that made again by Cheng Wei Liu. <clears throat> so this is actually showing the spin configuration as I move within this imaginary time space. So the, it's just a single Monte Carlo configuration which is, you know, has the time dimension and I'm just showing the configuration uh, at the different time slices. <clears throat> and you can see what's plotted here is also the magnetization in those slices. Uh, and you see this system is already pretty big, so you can already see that there's a quantum phase transition happening here, even from a single Monte Carlo configuration. Then, of course, you should sample and do many, and then the curves will become smoother. Okay. Uh, right. So I hope that's clear what it was. So, if you, yeah. so it's just moving within the configuration and looking at the, the states. So now we can, you know, get expectation values as a function of, of this space here. And this is really, you know, related to time, right, which is related to, to S. 
uh, and we can look at the kind of scaling that, that I did before. But now I want to do something a little bit uh, more difficult. Let, let's say that, okay, let's say we know the, all the exponents, but we don't know the critical point. So can we use this to extract the critical point? <clears throat> and in this case, we actually expect uh, theoretically, and it's very well established that the dynamic exponent is one. Right. So now we are no, no longer in the realm of uh, stochastic dynamics, although we are doing a stochastic simulation, but the dynamics we are probing is the actual quantum dynamics coming from the Hamiltonian evolution. Right. So the dynamic exponent should be one, and we know in this case that uh, nu is around 0.7. It's known more precisely than that. <clears throat> so. What we want to do in this scaling form is to eliminate one of the arguments because it's difficult to deal with two arguments. So if we know what z is and nu is, we can make this a constant. Then that's no longer an argument and we just are back to the normal finite size uh, scaling form. And again, I, I show the bind accumulant, which we have talked about already. <clears throat> so we already have seen it in the classical Ising model. And now we plot this as a function of s, uh, but uh, now it's non-equilibrium. So v times lz plus 1 over nu is kept constant, and it's done for different sizes. So it looks not very much like the standard finite size scaling. You can see the cumulant crossings, and we can analyze the crossings uh, as we did before. Uh, and we can get, uh, it turns out we got, again, the best so far value for the critical coupling of this model, for whatever that's worth, but it's just a byproduct of, of uh, you know, our uh, intention to show that this is working. Right? <clears throat> okay, let me make a short note on quantum Monte Carlo simulation dynamics, because people have done a lot of dynamics studies related to the D-wave machine, and there's a method called simulated quantum annealing when, when you see the term, you may think that it has, is doing Monte Carlo simulations of, of the quantum dynamics. So it's a Monte Carlo method. But actually what the method is doing, it's doing a, a normal Monte Carlo simulation, uh, typically the finite temperature kind of simulation that we discussed before. And then as the simulation goes on, you change some parameter in the Hamiltonian, like the transversal field. Uh, okay, so something is changing as a function of time, but the time now is your time or the computer's time. It's not the Hamiltonian time. Uh, but anyway, this has been used as a sort of, uh, uh, well, it has been called simulated quantum annealing, so people somehow seem to believe that it has something to do with uh, uh, quantum dynamics. And based on uh, such studies, it was claimed actually by these people, there are many co-authors, that the D-wave machine is actually quantum mechanical because they got similar results from simulated quantum annealing and, uh, uh, and the D-wave machine, okay? But the problem is, uh, this is not really Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, it only accesses the dynamics of the quantum Monte Carlo simulation method, which we <coughs> also demonstrated in our paper. I mean, it's somehow quite, quite clear, I think, from the outset, but we decided to, to really show it because it seemed like you know, people didn't really believe that. Uh, so what we did was to study the one, just the clean system, the 1D Heisenberg sorry, that 1D transverse field icing chain. Uh, and then we did exactly the kind of kibble surek scaling I told you about first. Namely, we know that the critical point is at S equals 1 half. So we can do the uh, ramp to, to that point. And then we can do measure at that point and we can do def different system sizes and so on. Okay, if we do the right thing, which is doing the simulation time dynamics, no, sorry, no, no, the imaginary time dynamics, uh, if we pretend that we don't know the dynamic exponent is one, we still get the exponent one. Uh, actually here we just say, okay, we know what it is, let's see if the scaling works, but it would be the same if we try to optimize it. We will get 1.001 or something like that. <clears throat> so we get the right dynamic exponent because we do quantum dynamics. If we instead do, you know, what they do, 
we get 2.17 for the dynamic exponent. And you recognize that as the dynamic exponent of the 2D uh, classical metropolis algorithm. And why do you get that? Well, because this 1D chain maps onto a 2D model, which effectively is a 2D icing model. And now you do some local updates on it. Uh, and uh, then this is the, what you expect. You expect that. You can also do cluster updates on it. Then you get 0.3. So then you, know, then you see quite clearly that this doesn't probe uh, the system. It probes your algorithm. Whereas what we are doing probes the actual uh, system. OK, Matthias will be here uh, next week, I guess. So you can ask him about this if, if you don't believe me. I don't know what he will say. <coughs> uh, all right, so that was uh, a little parenthesis here. Uh, and again, to stress that what we are doing is really, truly Hamiltonian dynamics. And now I don't think I have much time. Well, OK, I have 10 minutes left, so I can at least tell a little bit about what we did for uh, a quantum spin gla a glass problem. <clears throat> Actually, one which has been used uh, quite a lot in the past to, to sort of uh, uh, study this idea of quantum annealing. OK, so at the classical level, we, level, we have a, a graph. And it's a random graph. So each spin is connected to three other spins, but at random. So it looks like a, a beta lattice, but it's a bit different because in the end, everything closes. And all spins are really, there are no you know, hanging uh, branches. <clears throat> so for example, for n equals 8, these are some of those random graphs. Now, it uh, turns out that, uh, amazingly, uh, uh, this classical model, if you put icing spins on it and you make all couplings antiferromagnetics, that means it's, it's uh, frustrated. Uh, it has a mean field glass transition where TC is actually known exactly. Uh, so that we, we actually studied this kibble surek uh, approach on the classical model as well and confirmed that it worked. And then we, we did the, the put on the transverse field. <clears throat> and actually, I was involved in some work some years ago, too, where we, we did this in, in some other ways. Some, uh, the first order here, uh, author here is Eddie Farhis, who is one of the pioneers of this quantum adiabatic uh, algorithm. Uh, so he and uh, some of his collaborators at MIT, they did uh, what's called the quantum cavity approximation, which is a kind of improved mean field way to study the quantum system. <clears throat> um, and then we also did quantum Monte Carlo and looked at excitation gaps extracted from Monte Carlo data. So we believe that the critical point should be around there. Uh, we decided to take another look at this with this uh, imaginary time annealing. Uh, and then we actually study uh, also the spin glass order parameter. I don't think I have much time to discuss what that is for those who don't know it. But <clears throat> basically, in a glass, you really you cannot use something like the magnetization because you don't know the pattern of ordering. And you have many uh, symmetry broken states. Uh, or I should say many glassy states that correspond to some kind of replica symmetry breaking. What you can do is you do two independent simulations and you look at the overlaps of them. That will actually uh, serve as an order parameter. So we analyze Q squared, which is the spin glass order parameter squared. Uh, and we again study the bind accumulant. But now we don't know anything. We, we don't want to assume anything. <coughs> we uh, don't know the exponents. We don't, well, we know roughly what SC is, but we don't pretend not to know it. So how can we now eliminate uh, one argument here? Well, one could actually do some sophisticated two-parameter scaling, but we decided it's too complicated, at least initially. <clears throat> so then we just do like this. We say, OK, this second argument here, if that argument goes to zero when n goes to infinity, then we are, again, we can just neglect it and use only one argument scaling. So if, if, but we don't know the exponent, right? But if we use the velocity is n to minus alpha, and this alpha just happens to be big enough, then the argument goes away. But we don't really know what big enough is. So we, we have to try several values and see in the end that we have some sort of consistency. Uh, 
And, uh, okay, the largest alpha we did was 17 twelfths. And, okay, this was, again, done by my former student, uh, Chang Wei Liu. And uh, I guess we have to ask him exactly why he chose 17 divided by 12, but it's, a, it's an okay number. Uh, we have other numbers as well which give the same results. But then we can, again, uh, do similar things as I discussed for extracting critical points. We do curve crossings. Uh, of the bind accumulant, and eventually we do an extrapolation, and it's quite consistent with the previous value, but with better accuracy. <clears throat> okay, so I still want to just say a little bit about what we get for exponents here, because those are in the end what we can relate to, say, have some relevance for quantum computing. So uh, now we look at, now we have determined the critical point, so now we, we do scaling at the critical point. We know what the value is, so then we can, again, get back to this kind of one-parameter scaling with the velocity. And then we do, again, scaling collapse, as I showed you before. Uh, and we, you know, have to adjust the exponents because we don't know what they are now. But we adjust them until we get scaling collapse and try to do it carefully. And, and, uh, and uh, we get some, you know, pretty big error bars on them. And actually, we... If from this analysis, we only get these exponent combinations. But actually, that's fine, because these are the exponent combinations that are uh, important. Uh, and we also, as a check, we did a fully connected graph, Sherrington-Kirkpatrick model, meaning we have some spins, and they are all connected to, to each other completely. That's known to be a mean field kind of uh, spin glass. <clears throat> and for that one, we also got uh, those exponents. I should say it's believed to be, uh, because actually it, it, these values differ from you know, what they are supposed to be. Uh, so there's a theoretical paper based on some field theory arguments uh, that claim that the value should be like this. Um, so we think we are actually uh, not in agreement with these. Uh, and actually... It could be that it's fine because this paper also points out that it's not so clear cut because there are some logarithmic corrections and all kinds of things. So it may be that actually uh, this transition in the end is quite quite complicated. It may not be just power law scaling, uh, we, but we see at least effectively you know good power law scaling, but not with the correct exponents. Okay, but what's what's the point with these exponents? Well, let's. <clears throat> look at, uh, you know, the kibble surek kind of arguments. So according to kibble surek that if we want to uh, go to the critical point, so we have some system, and we are asking about approaching a critical point, so there's some parameter S here, and we want to go here. Uh, okay, let's say we have a glass here. Uh, this is eventually where we want to go to S equals 1. But actually, the kibble surek scaling can only tell us about how long does it take if we want to stay in equilibrium up to that point. Okay? Well, that's at least part of the problem, right? You, you want to stay in equilibrium here. <clears throat> but then, you know, it's not as easy as in the standard case that we talked about. We have a gap, like in the ferromagnet, we have a gap you know, that is the smallest here. But actually, in this case, it may be more like, okay, the gap vanishes, but, you know, then there's actually a lot of gapless states here. Uh, so it's actually all hell, hell breaks loose when you get, go in there. So we just ask, can answer something about the first stage of going to, to the critical point. <clears throat> okay, so that's... No, but we have an exponent. We have a value for that exponent. <clears throat> okay? Uh, now, but there's another thing we can say, because when we come to the critical point, we have some critical scaling of the order parameter at the critical point, and that tells us something about how close we are to the final solution, because <clears throat> this order parameter has some value at the final point here. And if we have some power law scaling here, how close we are to that, somehow depends on the exponent. So the order parameter scales like this. And now you see I have actually expressed everything with n, because actually in this thing, you know, there's no 
spatial length. Everything is connected. There's just n. There's no l. Uh, so we have a value for that exponent. OK, let's compare that with the classical exponent. So if you do classical simulated annealing uh, to get uh, you know, to the classical glass transition, <clears throat> these are the exponents. So those are, are very solid. Now you see that actually this value is larger in our case, which is actually bad because that means that we are a little bit further from, from the ordered state. Uh, and also, the, this combination of exponents is larger, so it actually means that it takes longer for us to, to reach the critical point if we want to stay in, in, um, in equilibrium. So the picture is this. There's some phase diagram in the, uh, uh, as a function of the field. I, I could say S here, but you know S is related to the field, transverse field. So we have been looking at the transition in the ground state. If you look at the classical one, then you're looking at the classical glass transition. So actually, there's a glass phase. And where we really want to go is in the corner there, when the, at zero temperature and zero field. And the question is, what path is, is best to take? <clears throat> now we have just said, well, it's actually, if you just ask how long it takes to get to the boundary, it's better to go here than to go here. So actually, in, in this case, it seems then that uh, you know, quantum annealing is not such a good idea. Uh, uh, well, we don't, strictly speaking, know what happens when we go, we go in there, but at least this is telling us something. Okay, then the other proposal we had was that, in principle, with the D-Wave machine, they could also do this kind of scaling uh, exploration, which apparently they haven't done. I just talked to somebody recently who said that one reason they haven't done that is that D-Wave doesn't allow people to change the time. They only want, to, want the time to be what they think it should be. OK, so that is it. Uh, and I will take some que uh, questions. Uh, no, I think, well, at least in the paper I cited, the, what they said is that since they do quantum dynamics and the D-Wave machine looks similar, it must mean that the D-Wave machine does quantum dynamics. But my argument is that they actually don't do quantum dynamics. So then it doesn't mean anything, probably, I think. Yes? Uh, well, again, the, the problem is that we know that there are classical problems that uh, if you apply any of the known methods, the scaling is exponentially bad, right? Okay, in this case, uh, it's not exponentially bad to, oops, to go to the critical point, but it becomes exponentially bad when you go further into the glass phase, right? So what we have done addressed here is really just how long it takes to go to the phase boundary, but inside the phase, the time scales become exponential. At least, you know, people know that from for simulated annealing, for example. If you continue down here, you need an exponentially long time in the system size. The hope has been that if you go this way, the power law scaling will, will continue all the way down. I, I don't know if anybody still believes that. At least in general, I think nobody believes it. But I think the hope is that at least there is some class of problems for which, you know, classically it takes exponentially long, quantum mechanically it takes some, you know, power law uh, time. Then you would have, you know, made some significant progress. But if that's going to be true, I, I, I don't know. But what I'm claiming is that what we are doing with imaginary time dynamics is a way to test that without having a quantum computer, right? Because you can do the quantum simulation in imaginary time. We know that they're the same to order v squared. So you can formulate a uh, criterion for being adiabatic in imaginary time, which will hold in real time. And then you just do the simulation and check. It's still not trivial to do the simulation because these systems are glasses. So 
this comes back to what Werner uh, Kraut talked about. Okay, we need better methods, right? So he has invented good methods for certain classes of problems where you overcome this, you know, long sampling time scales. In, in the case of a quantum spin glass of the transverse field, field easing type, we actually don't have a good way to sample these configurations. We know how to do it in principle, but it's very slow. But I think that's fine because, okay, we will waste some, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of CPU hours, but at least we can answer some uh, relevant problems. I'm sure that we can, you know, do big enough sizes to, to still see the scaling in the same way as people have done, you know, classical uh, spin glasses, even if they, you know, strictly speaking, are, you know, untractable problems because the scaling is so bad, people still do it and it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you can do this for regular systems and you can what I, do what I said, you can do imaginary time and relate it to real time. But if you really want to do the simulation in real time, you cannot because then you get phases and you know, it's, it just uh, becomes completely crazy. You cannot do it. But if you want to study something close to the adiabatic limit, which is Often what, what is interesting, you know, what, what are the corrections to the adiabatic uh, limit? You can get it up to power V squared uh, by doing this. So I think it's, it's quite useful. Right, yeah, so it's just, uh, you know, a practical reason because, you know, when you do data collapse, how do you do data collapse? Uh, I guess there are many ways to do it, but the simplest way I know is that you have your, <coughs> your data for different system sizes. So let's say you, you first you just take your data and you have, let's say, in, in our case, we have a velocity. So let me just plot the data as a function of velocity. And then you have, uh, you know, your, your uh, you know, m squared. If you plot your data, uh, you know, maybe they just look like like, uh, like this. So this is for different system sizes. Let's say L equals 8, 16, 32, right? Okay, so now you want to multiply that by L to some X. Uh, and, you know, here also times L to some, you know, Y. <coughs> Okay, and then you want to have some automatic way of finding the, the best values where they collapse. Okay, the way we do that is you just take a polynomial and then you fit it to all the data, right? Um, you know, th this looks crazy, but uh, okay, this has a very bad chi-squared value, but you know, it's well-defined. Uh, and then you just, so you, you get, from this, you get a chi-squared value, which depends on x and, and y. Uh, and chi-squared is defined relative to that curve. And now you just optimize x and y, you know, until, you know, all these points come, which means that all these points come as close to possi as possible to that curve. So to do that, you need a curve, uh, you know, relative to which you defined, define chi-squared. And you see this data here, it's, it's not really good to fit this to a polynomial because, okay, on the log-log scale, it's a straight line. If you don't do log-log, it decays, uh, you know, like a power law. <clears throat> so it's not good to uh, fit to a polynomial. But on the other hand, we know that this should be a straight line. So up to the point where it is consistent with a straight line, we use a straight line. And then, actually, I think Cheng Wei did it even uh, on a log yeah, he did it on this scale, right? So, so, so then, um, you know, he did it on the log scale. So then it's a straight line, and then, you know, this is described by a polynomial. So it's just to have a, a, a reference point to define chi-squared. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's some better function that we could use, which has this form, but uh, we didn't uh, think of any at the time, and this worked quite well. And the point is that if you have a lot of points, you know, even if your function has, you know, eight or nine parameters, it's fine because we have hundreds of points. Actually, I forgot to point out, but it's probably clear that, you know, 
here when, when this flattens out here, that's when the normal finite size scaling applies. That's when, when this argument is so small that uh, you have reached, uh, basically it's a constant. So this is where, uh, you know, you, you just have in this case the power law. <clears throat> All right. Time for lunch. Thank you.